The Southern Alberta Council on Public Affairs acknowledges that we are gathered on the lands of the Blackfoot people of the Canadian Plains, and we pay respect to the Blackfoot people past, present, and future, while recognizing and respecting their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. We offer respect to the Métis and all who have lived on this land and made Lethbridge their home. My name is Jill Young. I am the CEO of YWCA Lethbridge and District, and I am honored to speak today about our organization that has been deeply rooted in this community for 75 years. Today we're going to look at that question, why is YWCA still needed in this community after 75 years? I will be going through key, key statistics from the programs that we offer, providing information about all of those key programs, as well as a little bit more to take the stories beyond those statistics and words on a page. And behind me, you will see that I have, to my right, is Lena Neufeld. Lena is our facilities manager, although she has held many positions at YWCA over the years. And she is speaking as an individual who has worked at YWCA for almost 40 years. Wow. Wow. On my left, we have Lorian Johansson. Lorian is part of our external relations team, and she will be speaking from firsthand experience why YWCA is so important to her and this community. So a little bit about who we are. Why are we relevant? We were founded here in Lethbridge in 1949. YWCA is part of a larger movement. We are a member association that is part of the national YWCA movement called YWCA Canada. There are 30 YWCAs across Canada, but we are also a global movement. We are represented in six continents across the globe and nearly 200 countries. It's an incredible movement that focuses on empowerment and supports the communities that are in need with moving gender empowerment forward. So here in Lethbridge, we were founded in 1949 and incorporated in 1951. Um, and what you see here up on the screen are some of our historical photos of some of the grassroots initial pictures that are still in the Galt archives as well that can be accessed. Um, but we have some amazing photos of the history over this last 75 years. So our mission is to enhance lives through empowerment and a supportive community. But our vision is that we're created by women. Our board, actually, is 100% women. It is women-led. And it is leading the community with innovative solutions to enrich lives, promote fulfillment, and create happiness. And our values are health and well-being, perseverance, community, mentorship, integrity, safety, and equity. And these values are what drive us as we look at the programs that we offer and how we offer it. So what are the programs that we offer today in 2024? We offer Hestia Homes. So Hestia Homes is a program for youth that are vulnerable to homelessness age 17 to 24. Over the past year, we helped serve 17 youth in this program. And it is incredibly important for these youth to gain independent life skills. 
As youth enter into this program, they are provided not only a roof over their heads, that's the simple basic necessity, but you'll also notice that we've got over 100 referrals made. And that's how we connect them with the community and help them build those skills so that when they tr transition out at either age 25 or at a time where they feel that they're able to live independently, they are able to then move on and have those connections and those skills that are able to make them successful. Safe visitation. So this is the program that promotes, as you can see on our, our slide here, that it promotes the maintenance and rebuilding of healthy relationships between children and non-custodial parents. We are the only facility in Lethbridge that offers this program at no cost. This is reducing the barriers that truly uh, impact a family as they're navigating very difficult and quite often very challenging court systems to ensure that the family is safe and that we are building those relationships in a positive environment for everyone. We have facilitators that monitor the visits, promote the play, and support participants in navigating parenting. Oftentimes, we will also see parents that don't necessarily have that relationship with their children, or they don't have the skills of parenting to know how to engage with their children. So our facilitators work with those families to ensure that they are building towards a successful relationship. Over this past year, we have served more than 158 families with 428 visits. And into that program, we do have a waiting list for this program. We are limited with time. We are often court ordered uh, with families and individuals as well because of our no cost, low barrier program. Uh, and we had those 12 new family intakes. Our neighborhood play program. I say this with so much affection. Uh, it's one of my favorite programs, and I'm not biased at all. Um, but it is a summer program. It's uh, based at six parks throughout Lethbridge. Uh, no longer in Colehurst anymore, as they're uh, actually looking at a different program to operate on their own. Um, but this is a program that we have leaders at six different parks throughout Lethbridge that offer a no-cost drop-in program that is available from Monday to Friday, holidays excluded, where it encourages learning through play. So again, this is identifying and removing those barriers for families. We all know that camps can be expensive for our kids. Childcare can be expensive for the kids. And as our economy continues to have an impact on our financials and continues to have that strain on where we're at today, offering programs like this, where it is childcare at no cost, learning through play, engagement, it allows every child that needs it to have an opportunity to have supervised play. So we had over 1,600 children. Um, so 17 young adults employed. Quite often we see individuals going from high school to post-secondary, many post-secondary students looking for work throughout the summer. This is a great opportunity for them and we actually see quite a bit of year-over-year -year return by the staff. Oh, Amethyst Project. Unfortunately, due to funding, at the end of March, which was the end of our fiscal this past year, we needed to close the doors to Amethyst Project. What is or what was Amethyst Project, you may ask? Mm -hmm. Amethyst Project was a program that we offered with 24-7 support where we were on call with sexual assault advocates for those experiencing sexual assault. 
We had fostered a relationship and partnership with Chinook Regional <coughs> Hospital, as well as LPS, to identify that once a victim has come forward with a sexual assault or a potential sexual assault, one of our advocates was brought into the hospital through those referrals and we would connect with them and help navigate through the challenging decisions that they may have to make during that time. During that time where an individual is sitting in the hospital, it can be very vulnerable. And there's a lot of things that are going through their heads. The aim of this project allowed individuals to have a third alternative, what we call the third option. And the third option allows a sexual assault kit to be taken anonymously. And it is held at the LPS station for a period of up to one year. This option allowed individuals to take the time after that period, once they have left the hospital, once they've had an opportunity to actually understand some of the traumas that they have been impacted, to determine and decide whether they want to proceed with legal action. That time allows them to heal. We would be able to provide them access and connections to various resources, whether that need be counseling or what they needed in their time of trauma and healing. In this past year, we saw 98 individuals served. We also saw five of those individuals were males. Out of those 98 individuals, 17 of them chose to go with the third option. You'll also see another staggering number there is that we also served 13 individuals under the age of 18. When we received the news that we did not receive the funding for this program uh, earlier this year, it was devastating because this is such an essential service that we provided to the community and it is so important to the individuals that received this advocacy. I did work with LPS, the Victim Services Unit, as well as Chinook Sexual Assault Center, and we created a new collaboration that although Amethyst Project itself does not live under YWCA doors anymore, it does, in essence, still have a response in the community, which is the important piece of this that I want to emphasize to everyone sitting in this room. I ensured that with this collaboration, that no matter who presented themselves at the hospital, that they would still be able to have that third option available. So it's incredibly important, and it is sad for us as YWCA, but the broader picture is it's still there in the community, and that's incredibly <coughs> important and why we do the work. Harbor House. Probably what we are most well known for in Lethbridge, in this community, is Harbor House. Harbor House is our 24-7 emergency shelter for women and families fleeing domestic violence. We are funded for 24 beds, which means 24 heads on a pillow. So if a mother presented presents herself with three children, that is four people and four beds that are being taken up. We offer all of our participants a wide variety of different resources once they present and have been brought into the shelter. Sexual assault advocacy, daily educational programming, we have goal setting, we have on-site child care, we also have a partnership with Lethbridge School Division where we have an on-site teacher that is funded through Lethbridge School that provides uh, school age curriculum based programming available for any students of school age that are interested in attending school while they are in shelter. 
We also have what we affectionately call the hidden treasures, where individuals and clients are able to shop. I say that in quotation marks because there's no cost. This is an area where uh, we receive a wide variety of different donations throughout the community, and those uh, donations are able to go directly to those clients that we serve. So they're able to go in, uh, look at clothing that would be available for them as needed, uh, and we also provide them as they come in with a welcome package, which includes all of their basic needs, uh, hygiene items, as well as blanket and, and comfort items that may fit best for them as they enter into the space. Over the last year, we received 2,300 crisis calls. Those calls are calls to ask about, where's our capacity? Can you take me? Are you available? Is there space for me right now? They're calls about, what do I do next? I'm not ready to leave, but I have a lot of questions and I don't know where to go. There's also questions that just say, I have a friend that's going through this. How can I help? We answer all of those calls 24 hours a day. When an individual enters into Harbor House, we also have a, a list of questions that we ask that individual as we go through some of their history and where they're at today in their journey. So I do want to show this number of 164 sexual assaults that were disclosed in shelter upon entry. The last year, we served and sheltered over 400 individuals through our doors here in Lethbridge. We were able to serve 400, but unfortunately, due to capacity and those 24 beds, we were not able to serve or admit more than 800. That includes children. Based on the trends that I have been seeing over the last several years, I anticipate that if I were to be presenting this next year at this time, that number will be over 1,000. Our numbers are not going down. The rate of domestic violence in Lethbridge is increasing. This is an incredibly important topic to speak about, and we will address some of that stigma and silence around domestic violence. So many people are still scared to talk about it, afraid of the repercussions, and so are we. It's not a comfortable topic to talk about the different types of abuse, of violence that we see. It is tough, it's uncomfortable, but change only happens through a place of being uncomfortable. We need to talk about it. Okay. Okay. So I'm just gonna skip here to some of our access trends that we saw last year. We saw an increase in, in crisis calls. We saw almost a 20% increase in turnaways due to capacity. I want to emphasize that there are other reasons that we're not able to admit individuals into our shelter. Um, but when it comes to being at capacity, we're seeing an increased need and demand for individuals presenting to the shelter. And so this demand is only going to be increasing. We've also seen a significant increase in children being presented to uh, the shelter with their parent. When I looked at some of the stats, stats over a three-year period, what I saw was individual women presenting to the shelter was an increase of about 11%, so pretty stable, actually, over the course of three years. But women and their children 
coming to the shelter was over 200% increase. So I know that we have a few minutes left, and I really want to put some stories behind these stats. And to my... We're over here now. <laughs> over here. Uh, Lena uh, is going to be coming up and, and speaking about the um, evolution of working at YWCA over 40 years. Um, she has an incredible legacy, and only she can actually speak about it best. So, Lena. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I might be reading a lot. That's just because looking at you makes me nervous. <laughs> and come close. Okay. I can hardly believe how much time has passed. It feels like just yesterday when I walked through the doors full of excitement and uncertainty. But what I could never have no predicted was that how much the world would change. It's 1986 and I'm a student at the university delivering food at night to make some money. I wasn't very happy doing that, so I was looking for something more meaningful to do. My roommate came home one evening and said, they're looking for some staff to work in Harbor House. I didn't exactly know what happened at Harbor House, but I thought it was worth a try and maybe I could learn something too. When I started there, our understanding of the issues we now confront daily, domestic violence, homelessness, and sexual violence, was so different. There were fewer resources, less awareness, and at times it felt like we were trying to fight uphill battles with little recognition of the real challenges people were facing. But we did it because the work mattered, and it still does. The first few years in 1986 and 87 were some of the most challenging years that I've experienced at the YWCA. The organization was in turmoil. Uh, the current executive director had left and a board member had stepped in as acting, C acting ED. The leadership was unstable and the staff morale was deteriorating. What made it even more difficult was that some of the staff were actively working against the agency. One day when I came on shift, I found three of our full-time staff huddled in the office with all of the organizational files, with the policies and procedures all laid out. They were writing down information from the files. When I asked what was going on, they simply said, you didn't see us here. It was a surreal moment, realizing that my own co-workers, people that I thought I could trust, were plotting to take the shelter contract away from the YWCA and start up their own competing shelter. Working in that environment was incredibly hard. It wasn't just the emotional toll of supporting women and children in crisis, but also the tension and the distrust among the staff. I felt like I was walking a fine line, trying to do my job while navigating the internal conflicts. It's one thing to face challenges with clients who are going through their own battles, but it's another to face disloyalty from colleagues who were supposed to be working toward the same goal. But despite the challenges, I stayed. I stayed because I believed in the YWCA's mission and what we were doing for women and children who needed us. Looking back now, I realize that those tough times shaped not only the organization, but also me. It was a reminder that this work isn't always easy, whether it's dealing with clients or navigating internal struggles. But in the end, what matters is sticking to our purpose and standing up for what's right. Ultimately, I fell in love with the job. It became a passion. The women, the children, and all of their stories reeled me in. I couldn't get enough. Their willingness to share their stories with me, to trust me, even though they had just been betrayed by someone that they loved, 
It stirred up something in me, and I understood that I also had something to give to them. All of their family secrets, their cultural beliefs, and their betrayals were shared freely with me. The work has always been hard. There have been days when it feels like the weight of the world is on your shoulders, when the pain and the trauma that you witness from the women and the children walking through our doors is almost unbearable. I've had moments of doubt, wondering if we were doing enough, if I was strong enough. Yes, times have changed. Our programs have grown, new initiatives have come and gone, and the way we talk about the work we do has evolved. The people we see have changed a lot over these 40 years. Many of the women coming through our doors now have complex mental health issues and addictions. Our jobs as frontline workers, sorry, our jobs as frontline workers have become more complex, mental, more challenging, I'm sorry, and sometimes it feels impossible. We're often faced with situations where we can see the potential for change, but if the client isn't ready or able to make those steps, we can't do it for them. It's a tough reality to accept, but it doesn't mean that they won't ever change. It just means that they can't do it right now. Maybe they can do it the next time they come see us. It's a difficult process for anyone to work through, and we know that research shows it can take a person multiple attempts to finally leave an abusive situation. That's the nature of the work we do. It's long, it's hard, and it requires patience. But we plant seeds, and sometimes we don't see the results right away, and that's okay. But here's the encouragement in all of this. I've had women come up to me years later, women I didn't think I had reached, and they've thanked me. Thanked me for something I said or did during their time at the YWCA that helped them on their journey. It's those moments that remind me why we do what we do. It's not about immediate results, it's about being there offering support and knowing that even if we don't see it at the time, we might have played a role in someone's journey to have a better life. Supporting a woman who's just left an abusive relationship, helping a young person find their footing after a life of instability, these moments remind me why I've stayed. Seeing someone leave with a little more hope, a little more strength, it makes all the struggles and the long days and the emotional toll worth it. As I look back on these decades, I'm proud to have been part of the YWCA's evolution. Over the years, we've faced many struggles, both within the organization and in the work that we do. We've seen changes in leadership, moments of instability, and internal challenges that could have shaken us. But through it all, our core has remained healthy, strong, and deeply dedicated to that work that we are known for. No matter what hurdles we've encountered, our commitment to supporting women and children has never wavered. We all understand that one stay in the shelter doesn't magically solve everything. And that's okay. Maybe it won't happen the first time, or the second, or even the sixth stay, but we'll be here every time. Our role is to offer support and encouragement whenever someone is ready to take that next step towards change, no matter how long that process takes. What's important is that our participants know we are here for them, whether it's now or the next time, or whenever they need us. Our doors will always be open and we'll continue to walk alongside them on their journey. That's what we're here for. Thank you. Always adjusting the mic for the short person. <clears throat> Thank you, Lena. <coughs> it's going quick. Usually when I speak about the work that the YWCA does, the causes we advocate for, and the programs we offer, I'm speaking in statistics and numbers, data trends, and general facts. Today is different. Today I'm speaking as a survivor of domestic violence. 
16 years ago, I was a resident in Harbour House. The man I was in a relationship with at the time ended it, two days before I was having major surgery. It was the last straw for him, apparently. It had been the definition of an unhealthy relationship, filled with threats of suicide, narcissistic behavioral patterns, and abandonment. <clears throat> I couch surfed for those two days and was actually grateful to be admitted to the hospital because at least I'd have somewhere to stay. I had no money, no job. My family wasn't an option for support. I was utterly alone. Once I was discharged, I came to Harbour House. I was hoping to rekindle the relationship, obviously not thinking clearly. The staff at Harbour House was kind, supportive, and understanding, and helped me arrange for my new life with housing, financial support, and counselling. Everything I owned fit into my beat-up little car, but it was a start. Eventually, I found employment, enrolled in some career training classes, reconnected with my family, and settled into a cozy little life. One of the things I remember most clearly about my time in Harbour House was the night that cabbage rolls were on the dinner menu, but no one knew how to make them. Very hesitantly, I offered to show everyone how to soften the cabbage and make the stuffing mix and finish the dish. The ladies who were on shift that night warmly accepted my input, and all of us enjoyed a hearty meal that evening. I hadn't felt valued like that in so long that the emotional sensation was almost foreign. I'd like to stand here and say that this was a one-off, the only time I experienced any form of domestic violence, but it isn't. My childhood father exacted every form of abuse that you can think of, or if he hadn't, my ex-husband did. I was caught in a vicious cycle, moving from one bad man to another. I divorced the father at 16, changing my name to disconnect his identity from mine. I left the ex-husband six months after he put bruises on me for the first time. In every situation, the police and the courts had to get involved. I've been held at gunpoint, stalked and spied on, lost my autonomy in medical situations, and had to rebuild from the bottom on multiple occasions. Since then, I have once again rebuilt my life. I've become involved in this community, volunteering for and leading several nonprofit organizations and committees. I've regained my physical health and personal autonomy. I've developed valuable professional experience and skills. I've reconnected not only with myself, but with my family and friends. I have an amazing partner with whom I share a home and four fur babies. I'm happy in this beautiful life. When the opportunity to join the YWCA team came up earlier this year, I leapt at it, both feet all in. The chance to gather up all of the skills, lessons, experience, and talents that I've developed over the last 16 years and bring them back to the organization that gave me the ability to live again, it was and is the dream job. Fortunately, they said yes. What a, full circle, coming home moment every day is, and I couldn't be happier. The work that we do at the YWCA and the importance of the causes that we champion cannot be overstated. Lethbridge had 1,752 reported incidents of domestic violence in 2022, and studies show that only approximately 20% of incidents are ever reported. Some quick math shows that's roughly 8,700 incidents of domestic violence in Lethbridge alone. Those same studies also indicate that two out of every five women have experienced some form of domestic violence in their lifetime. I promise you know someone who has, even if you don't know it. So I suppose I am gonna talk about statistics a little. The YWCA has held a special place in my heart for 16 years. Without the ability to stay in Harbour House, I wouldn't be here today. It's so much more than a job for me. It's home. It's the reason I survived. And I'm not just surviving, I'm thriving. Thank you. Thank you. And as we are a little bit over time here, I will just leave it on this last slide as there are any follow-up questions as well. So thank you. Thank you very much.
to Jill, Lena, and Lorianne for their very personal and thought-provoking presentation. I'm sure <coughs> each of us was choking um, as we heard some of these stories. Thank you to the LSCO who have provided this room free of charge. Thank you for patronizing their lunch counter. Thank you to the University of Lethbridge for their ongoing support. Thanks to the Lethbridge Herald, as you saw, Al Bieber was here earlier, and other media for their coverage and support. And thanks to Ryan at Rogers TV for recording our sessions, which are available on TV and at sakpa.ca archives. Next week's topic is Chris Galloway, who is the executive director of Friends of Medicare. And he will be speaking on Stop the Destruction. We can rebuild our public health care. Join us then. OK, let's go to our question and answer period. I would invite our speakers pardon me, to come back up here and to form a line here for your questions. Okay, I'm willing to ask the very first question. What support do you have for high school students? Yesterday after swimming at the Stan Seaweed Pool, I met a group of four students and I always talk to the students. They think that I'm an old bag and they wonder what I'm saying to them. But it's okay, I'm relentless. So I said, there was four, four young women and I said, Hello, future, strong, young women who will make this country better. And they sort of stopped and looked at me, and they realized I was being positive. And um, I said to them, you know, from my viewpoint, I just want to let you know, things get better. Things will get better. And some of them said, really? <laughs> And some said, oh, that's wonderful. So I wonder, with the kinds of things that happen in high school to girls, what outreach might you have at high school? Thank you. What a fantastic question. Um, since COVID, um, we actually had to shut down some of our leadership programs that we did offer to youth and high school age students, um, including both girls and boys. Uh, we offered a program called Wise Guys, and we also offered a program called Girl Space that focused on leadership and empowerment and life skills through that age. Um, we have not reopened that program since as we look to navigate and ensure the programs that we have are connected to our mission and vision. Uh, but we are currently exploring different partnerships with different nonprofits that offer that exact same type of mentorship. But we also do quite a bit of engagement out into the high schools, especially through the February months, which is Teen Dating Violence Prevention Month, where we go into the high schools and we actually educate those students on healthy relationships and healthy signs of dating as they navigate such a new environment for them. So that's something really important that we offer for them. Thank you very much. Mary? Thank you for your presentation today. Uh, the, uh, your name? Oh, Mary Shillington. Uh, I have worked in the field of family violence uh, for the years I was working as a counselor and uh, worked with Lena too. So um, it's a tough uh, field to do and, and uh, self-care and support from each other uh, is very important. And so uh, what, what do you work at as a group of employees at Harbor House and to keep yourself healthy and to like leave that stuff behind, uh, still be, being very committed to the, to the work you're doing, but not, not having that work through you all the time. Uh, kind of sh shutting the door to do self-care. 
so I'll be interested to hear how you, how you manage it because that's really key. I will also, I will respond, but I'll also call up Lena and, and Lorian to also respond to this because self-care can be quite personal. Oh, thank you. I've got my heels on. Um, and uh, when I joined the YWCA in 2022, um, it was really apparent that there were quite a few different crises that were going on, and self-care was incredibly important. Um, so one piece that I implemented almost right away uh, when I joined the organization was I extended our benefits for some of our employee assistance program to ensure that there was availability across the staff regardless of your position or your tenure at the organization. It was incredibly important to create that no cost, um, no fee to those staff as it was a, a cost that was taken on by the organization. But we also encourage quite a bit of different engagements, team building. Uh, we've done some yoga uh, at the organization. We still have quite a few uh, gym spaces that are available for activities like that. And from a personal perspective, when I want to unwind and do some self-care, I spend some time with my kids. Uh, they are the one piece that really keeps me grounded, and I learn a lot from them. And it, it really takes me back to the place where it reminds me what I'm doing this for. Well, my answer is going to be a little similar to Jill's. I I do love my grandchildren dearly, and I play quite an active part in their lives, so that's very, very nice. And uh, I have also learned over the years that the problems that I hear all day are not my problems, and I can kind of leave them at work. Uh, it took a long time to get there, but I think I've finally arrived there doesn't happen every day, but for most days, I can leave work at work. Thank you. <laughs> Poor Bev, up and down and up and down with the mic. Um, Self-care is, I agree, very important, uh, and thank you for the question. It's, for me, I, I don't find my job work. Well, it is work, but it doesn't, because I don't function in the same spaces as Lena, uh, I'm more focused on engaging with our community. Uh, I get to tell the great stories and I get to meet people who want to help. So for me, it's a much less taxing emotionally. Uh, I have learned over the years how to take care of myself, uh, my dogs and cats, my family and friends, um, getting involved with the community uh, and the committees that I do uh, and then you know taking some time for myself whether that's uh, getting my nails done or enjoying a nice meal I still like cooking and I made the cabbage rolls just the other day by the way um, so it's things like that it's just taking care of myself and and like Lena says it's leaving work at work and understanding that all of my spreadsheets will be there when I get back oh, yeah. Very good. Hi, I'm Mike McKay. I, I wonder if you could give us a little bit of information about your funding. How much do you get from the government and how much have they cut off and how much do you depend on the public donations in that area? Perfect, yes. What a fantastic question. Um, we do receive, and we receive about 90% uh, of our operation funding from the provincial government. And the women's shelter sector is chronically underfunded. And I'm trying to not mince words here, but our last change and increase was more than a decade ago uh, for Harbor House funding. Uh, it is a sector that typically gets overlooked and we do need to do quite a bit of fundraising to ensure that the services that we offer are maintained. And we know that so much has changed in the last decade when it comes to food costs, staff wages, 
all of these client needs transportation. And for that to be continuously stagnant, and then of course the increased demand, we are constantly year over year forced to stretch our resources as much as possible, be as innovative as possible, but also rely on, on community donations for that. Not just from a financial aspect, but also physical items as well. So it's an important piece and advocacy is, is one of my main roles um, to also sharing the information here about what our organization does. Hi, I'm Jason Schreiner. Um, just adding to Mike's question, first of all, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your amazing work. Um, so throw out a number, like what, what does the community need to contribute to, uh, to top you up, right? How, how, I mean, locally, clearly we need to, we need to step up. Um, that 90% of your funding comes from one order of governance, that's great, but it, that's obviously not enough to me. So what's the number you need? And, um, and how do we contribute towards that? And if, if we don't have the financial resources, are there any other ways that locally we can contribute to helping you meet your goals and this important work? Thank you. Um, so our financials and our annual statements are posted as a nonprofit and registered charity. You're able to go and take a look at our financials and what we fundraise year over year. Um, doing the quick math, uh, we are an, about a $3.5 million operation with gross revenue and uh, we need about 10% for fundraising and, and different activities. So that's a big number. Uh, historically, we do have a great community support, but again, it continues to need to be stretched further and further, and the ability for individuals and community to financially donate continues to be further strained as well. I am not a believer that the onus should be on fundraising. I think that the model needs to be taken a look at. Um, but that's for another conversation and probably about another hour. If you're looking for ways to donate, to support, yes, financial donation is fantastic and we appreciate it with every beat of our hearts. Uh, you're able to go to our website and check out how to donate. There are other ways, including participate in our events. Be advocates, understand, share our message, be in the know, educate yourself as well about the challenges that are right here in your community. There's also physical donations, clothing, items of need. We're definitely looking for winter items right now as the weather starts to change. And we post regularly on our website for our monthly needs of the current hot topics, uh, items that we need on a monthly basis. And then the other piece is the gift of time. We appreciate volunteers, individuals that are interested in uh, spending time bringing our clients to hidden treasures or potentially making some cooking or, or whatever that volunteer opportunity looks for for you. Uh, so all of that information is on the website as well as any volunteer opportunities. You can reach out directly to communications which uh, goes straight to this lovely individual right here. Um, so thank you, that's an excellent question. Hi, my name is Henning Mundel, and my, my question relates to naming and potential changes over decades in relation to a name. I'll give a quick example. Uh, in the late si mid to late 60s, I worked for an organization called CUSO as a volunteer overseas that stood for Canadian University Service Overseas. They still have CUSO, but now it's just CUSO International. It doesn't stand for Canadian University Service Overseas. Now you know where I'm going. Oh. Young Women's Christian Association, when it started, has the, is it now mainly the acronym? And how, how has the mission changed? Another excellent question. YWCA stands for Young Women's Christian Association. And 
like he was saying and, and brought up, is that the evolution of what we are as an organization and what we represent mm -hmm. is an organization that welcomes all, regardless of your religion, regardless of your gender. Yes, some of our programs are specific, um, like our women's shelter, like Harbor House, but we are there to support the community. And with YWCA being a global movement, we legally are registered as Young Women's Christian Association from back in 1949, uh, or 1951, I should say. Uh, but we have colloquial, I can't even say the word today, but we've dropped the Young Women's Christian Association because we represent YWCA and, and what that is is an all-inclusive organization. We support the community regardless of, of religion or gender. We are here for what you need and what you support. There's been many conversations around whether we should look to source the legal change in terms of dropping the full wording of Young Women's Christian Association. But there's also an area, and I was, I was speaking with uh, an individual talking about the history of YWCA, and I, I want to emphasize that this organization was started by women. It was started by women that sought to seek change and find equality and empowerment in what they were doing. And yes, it was a group of Christian women. And we want to recognize that. And that's where we were and what it was. And this is what we are today. And it's important to have that distinction, but we don't want to forget the past either. Violet Mi'kmaq is my name. Thank you, ladies, for a very interesting presentation on a subject that is very dear to me. Um, I was a judge and a lawyer for many years. All of my working life, I worked in the justice system and uh, with a lot of domestic violence cases. And what's really surprised me about your statistics is the number of disclosures that you had from uh, your clients about sexual violence. I always felt that that was very much undisclosed in the cases that I heard, and um, uh, maybe for fear of uh, shame or embarrassment, uh, lots of times it would be outright denied by the victims who were testifying. So I guess I'm wondering what is different in your organization, what your secret is, that people will have that much trust in you that they will actually disclose those things that they don't to the police or the Crown or the courts. So it must be something in the way you're treating them when they come in, and I'd be really interested if you think that you know what those secrets are, because others could certainly gain from that information. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. It's the model that we operate under. Um, so when we ask some of these questions, there is a level of confidentiality that is shared, and there's no implication that they must press charges. And I'll actually go back to um, our Amethyst project, and one of the most important pieces of that was the confidentiality, anonymity, when it came to those sexual assault kits, because so many individuals were connected to that perpetrator. It was a family member, someone very close, and an individual that may have power over them that could change the course of their lives if they chose to press charges. So when they individuals enter into our facility, there is not an inclination or a pressure to place charges. We just want to understand where they're at in their journey. And it creates that disclosure much more openly in a form of saying, we want to know where you're at so that we know what resources we can provide you. And if you are seeking legal uh, repercussions, then we can actually take that to the next steps and get you connected with the right people in that way. So some of them are reported, some of them are not. We also need to know whether these individuals have reported and that we 
need to be aware of any uh, legal and court issues that they may be navigating through that process as well. Um, and so it's just a different environment and we want to ensure that there's a level of safety with those disclosures and, and how they do it and what their steps and bringing the power back to them to make that decision. Thank you very much. So my name is Knut Peterson. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming to talk about this, for many people, uncomfortable topic. Uh, my question relates to this, you know, sexual assault center. What is your working relationship with them? I think it's being actually being led by a former uh, chair of, or CEO of uh, YWCA, Christy. Casey, I think, right? Yes. So could you explain what your relationship with them are? Absolutely. With Chinook Sexual Assault Center, just like many organizations that offer various different support services throughout our community, we're connected. Um, when I talk about the resources that we connect uh, them with, uh, when I, I speak about the opportunities of how we work with the individuals, we can't provide all of these resources under one roof, as much as I would like to. Uh, and there are really key subject matter experts that work in some of these fields, including Chinook Sexual Assault Center. So depending on the individual when they're presenting into the uh, shelter, we are able to connect them with various different supports, including sexual, Chinook Sexual Assault Center, so that they have access to those resources should they want them, should they want to seek further guidance and support from those organizations as well. And yes, Christine uh, was a former YWCA CEO, and uh, she was the individual that brought Amethyst Project on board uh, at YWCA, and it's a little bit of a full circle as it has returned into uh, under the purview of Chinook Sexual Assault Center with Amethyst Project, so yeah. Jill, is there any, <clears throat> is there any last thought you would like to leave our audience with before they go home? Yes. I, there is so much to know about YWCA. Uh, we have had our ups and downs. We know that over the course of 75 years. Um, you will see those ebbs and flows as an organization. We've gone through some challenges and day-to-day -day frontline challenges and staff challenges, just like any other organization. But what's at the core is, is the work that we do. And as we move forward for the next 75 years, we want to make sure that the programs that we're offering are aligned and innovative with what the community needs and what we can also help provide. We're navigating some changes in our programs and what we can do, like I alluded to, with some of the youth leadership and potentially some future transitional housing to fit those gaps from individual women that are seeking a 21-day emergency shelter and finding those hurdles jumping into permanent market housing. So we're trying to look and see what the opportunities are that we could potentially fill that gap as an organization. So please do your education, do some reading. Uh, please reach out to us at any of these contact informations. Know what we're doing in the community. And if you have any questions, reach out to us at any time. We're faces just like you, and we love to hear from you. We love to hear the questions and constructive feedback if you have any.